Kids First, welcome to the seventh annual 2021 Standing with Children Awards Ceremony. I'm David Scher, the Executive Director. I wanna thank you, each one of you, for taking time to be with us today as we celebrate the work of our fellow Missourians who are working hard throughout the year to help the 9,000 children last year with substantiated cases of child abuse and neglect, an average of 25 children every day who relied on our child advocacy centers and our safe care network to be there for them and their families. Now I'd like to thank Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City for graciously serving as our presenting sponsor. I would also like to recognize our other sponsors, Children's Hospital of St. Louis, Children's Trust Fund, Hush Blackwell Strategies, Kit Bond Strategies, Central Bank, Keith Ray Mackey, Call and Gentry Law Office, Jack Jensen, Steve Rennie, Jenny Nicholas. The generosity of our sponsors made it possible to provide this event at no cost, and we are so grateful for their continued support of our mission of empowering adults to protect children across Missouri. I would also like to thank our small but mighty team members who have demonstrated incredible resilience over the past year, adapting how we operate as a result of COVID-19, as well as a major leadership transition when our former longtime executive director, jo Joy Osterley, retired after 14 years of service to Missouri Kids First. You'll hear from our staff in a few minutes, but I'd like to quickly introduce them now. Jenny Summerfield, our manager of member services and operations, Rebecca Bax, manager of training and education and our safe care program, Deidre Mason, our training and education coordinator, Jessica Seitz, our director of public policy, Jenny Dotson Wheel, our prevention coordinator, and Madeline Brandt, our amazing graduate student who is completing a practicum with us this spring and summer. I would also like to thank our board of directors for their leadership and service to Missouri Kids First. Over the next hour, you're going to hear amazing stories of humanity, perseverance, and resiliency. You will be introduced to award recipients who have made a measurable and significant impact in our dual work of preventing child abuse and also ensuring that victims of child abuse and neglect get help and get justice. Through the work of partnerships with the 15 regional child advocacy centers across Missouri, our safe care resource centers, our state agency partners, and other local, regional, and statewide partners, and our donors, we made a significant impact in the lives of children in 2020. Collectively, we did that through some innovative approaches in the face of a pandemic. We did that because people care. We did that because COVID didn't stop child abuse from occurring. It had actually highlighted it, making it worse. COVID-19 highlighted that adults truly are essential for kids, especially when schools, the primary place where kids feel safe to tell an adult about abuse, were closed. But the Child Advocacy Centers created innovative ways to ensure that kids got help. Our Safe Care Resource Centers made sure that medical exams were conducted, and our partners in prevention continued to elevate their game to expand prevention education. And I hope that after hearing these amazing stories, you will continue to support us and your local child advocacy centers through your volunteer time, serving on a board, making a financial donations, or other ways that you can help support our work and the work of our CACs and our resource centers across the state of Missouri, because your efforts can make a difference in the life of a child. Now to highlight some of the great work with our child advocacy centers, I'll turn it over to Jenny Summerfield. Jenny? Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Summerfeld, and I'm the Program Manager of Member Services here at Missouri Kids First. As a membership organization, nearly all of our work is centered around supporting Missouri's 15 regional child advocacy centers. We support our members' work through reliable and affordable professional training for direct service staff, public policy advocacy, and regular convening of CAC leadership and program staff to facilitate improvement of CAC services and operations statewide. This last year has posed a significant challenge to child welfare as critical efforts to slow the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic have led to unintended consequences for families' financial stability, mental health, and in some cases, physical safety. 
Child abuse and neglect reports drastically declined at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic as cities and eventually the state issued shelter-in-place requirements, leaving at-risk children isolated from the mandated reporters that so frequently receive and report disclosures of abuse to the state's child abuse and neglect hotline. In late March of 2020, the Missouri Department of Social Services issued an urgent press release that hotline rates had dropped by nearly half over a two-week period and urged all Missourians to be vigilant about monitoring the safety of children and reporting any concerns to the child abuse and neglect hotline to prompt help and services. Further compounding the risk for children during this time, the same shelter in place conditions that were isolating them from mandated reporters also exacerbated risk factors for abuse, such as parental stress, economic instability, and housing insecurity. During this time, child advocacy centers stepped up to meet the challenges and did whatever it took to continue providing high quality services to children and families. To safely serve their clients during this time, CACs had to quickly adapt their facilities, staffing, and service mechanisms. To provide just a couple of examples of how CACs adapted to continue serving their mission, many, service, many centers shifted their mental health services to a telehealth platform, and because of social distancing requirements, all centers were forced to restrict the number of occupants in the CAC at any given time and had to come up with creative solutions to serve families with multiple children and limited access to childcare. To more thoroughly illustrate how skillfully Missouri's child advocacy centers adapted their operations to the pandemic, we've invited Vicki Dudley, the Executive Director of Children's Center of Southwest Missouri in Joplin, to share her center story. Please join me in welcoming Vicki Dudley. Vicki, if you're with us, could you please unmute yourself? Yes. Good morning, and thank you so much for uh, including me in this invitation, Jenny. Our team did an excellent job of pivoting services during this very challenging year. Our services were never shut down and team members kept a positive attitude during very difficult situations. A couple of situations that particularly stand out for us. On a Friday afternoon in early April, we received a call from our MDT that a young girl that needed to be seen emergently for an interview and medical exam then the dreaded words came over the phone. Oh, and she is quarantined for COVID-19. At that point, we had measures in place to protect staff, MDT members, and clients from potential exposures. We were not prepared to handle an active COVID-19 case. Staff brainstormed options and we decided to do the emergent medical exam and wait to interview the child until she was past quarantine period. We contacted our collaborating physician at Freeman Health for advice. She helped us get the additional PPE supplies and told us what extra precautions to take. We removed everything from the medical room except the equipment and supplies necessary to conduct the exam. And I mean everything, we took pictures off the wall, removed pens, paper, tablets, everything from the room. Staff members involved in the case put on all essential PPE. We instructed the family to arrive at our back entrance so that we had limited um, any necessary exposures. The family was greeted by staff, given the necessary PPE and escorted to the exam room. We completed paperwork, met with the mom, and conducted the exam in the same room to uh, limit exposures. After the exam, we sprayed down all surfaces in the room with our ion sprayer, closed the door, and left the room untouched for two hours. The family and MDT were very appreciative of our ability to solve this problem and come up with a solution that exceeded expectations. Our counseling staff also went above and beyond, as Jenny mentioned, during the past year, they pivoted quickly to virtual sessions, something we had never done before. This involved establishing a secure virtual platform, acquiring laptops for all counselors, reformatting forms for electronic signatures, making sure kids had a reliable device, 
internet service, a private area for sessions, and supplies for activities. They also rearranged their entire schedule so that only one provider and family members were in the counseling center at a time. Community outreach programming also was challenging during the past several months. Many districts have been scrambling to meet the state mandate for child sexual abuse education for grades six through 12. Our community outreach coordinator met with Joplin school leadership to format an, a pivot virtual program for all sixth grade students. The curriculum was formatted for interactive sessions, which created some challenges in the beginning, but after a few tweaks, we were able to deliver the program successfully. When other service providers were identifying reasons for not providing services, CAC staff, MDT, and community partners stepped up and figured out how we could continue to serve children and families. I'm so, so very proud of our team and the efforts that we made during this time. And this is our beloved nurse uh, practitioner, Susan Pumphrey in all of her PPE garb. Thank you, Vicki. We really appreciate your willingness to share with us today. And for anyone that would like to read more stories like the one we just heard from Children's Center of Southwest Missouri, you can find them by clicking through the slider on the homepage of the Missouri Kids First website at missourikidsfirst.org. We normally select a single awardee from our network of child advocacy centers and their multidisciplinary team partners, but this year we decided to honor all 15 child advocacy centers in Missouri for leveraging their creativity and resources to continue serving children amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In doing so, they all exemplify the child first philosophy that the CAC and MDT models are built on. Please join Missouri Kids First in applauding the inspiring efforts of the following child advocacy centers in Missouri. Lakes Area Child Advocacy Center in West Branson under the leadership of Executive Director Melinda Ingram. Children's Center of Southwest Missouri in Joplin under the leadership of Executive Director Vicki Dudley. Simo Nasby in Cape Girardeau under the leadership of Executive Director Kendra E. Rainbow House Regional Child Advocacy Center in Columbia, under the leadership of CAC Director Brenda Porta, Porter and Executive Director Janie Bakudas. Child Protection Center in Kansas City, under the leadership of President and CEO Lisa Mizell. Ozark Foothills Child Advocacy Center in Poplar Bluff, under the leadership of Michael Turner and Danielle Mormon. Kids Harbor in Osage Beach, under the leadership of Executive Director Kara Gerdeman. Synergy Services Child Advocacy Center in Kansas City under the leadership of Gwen O'Brien and Tiffany Clark. Children's Advocacy Center of East Central Missouri in Festus under the leadership of CAC Director Kimberly Kemmerer. Children's Advocacy Center, I'm sorry, Child Safe of Central Missouri in Sedalia under the leadership of Executive Director Mary Asbury. The Children's Advocacy Center Incorporated in Springfield under the leadership of Executive Director Linda Saturno. North Central Missouri Children's Advocacy Center in Trenton under the leadership of Executive Director Verna Kelsey. Voices of Courage Child Advocacy Center in St. Joseph under the leadership of Executive Director Melissa Birdsell. The Child Center in Wentzville under the former leadership of Executive Director S Sissy Swift and now Interim Directors Amy Robbins and Christine Tenneyck. And last but not least, Children's Advocacy Set Services of Greater St. Louis under the leadership of Forensic Services Manager Marin Mellum and Executive Director Jerry Dunn. Congratulations to all of these centers on successfully weathering the past year and finding a way to continue helping children talk about their experience and heal from trauma. We encourage all participants today to connect with your local CAC by visiting their website, joining their mailing list, and following their social media to learn more about how they're helping children in your community and how you can support that work. You can find the CAC nearest you and links to their website by visiting MissouriKidsFirst.org and navigating to the Child Advocacy Center page listed under the Our Work tab. Thanks to everyone for your support today for the work of Child Advocacy Centers. And now, please welcome my colleague, Rebecca Bax. Thank you, Jenny, for highlighting the great work of the Child Advocacy Centers. I'm Rebecca Bax, Training and Education Program Manager for Missouri Kids First. Included in my role at the agency is the management of the Safe Care Network. 
Missouri's statewide coordinated medical response to child maltreatment. The work of the Training and Education Department is supported by Program Assistant Deidre Mason. Deidre had the unique experience of learning her role within Missouri Kids First almost entirely through remote communication and interaction. Deidre, it is a pleasure to work with you. Thank you for your dedication and determination to improve the quality of life for all Missouri's children. Just like the CACs, Missouri Kids First too had to adapt to the pandemic. This pivot was most notable in the area of training. Each educational event had to be converted to virtual where possible. Sadly, we had to cancel our first standalone offering of Child First after discontinuing the child abuse investigation course. Our investigation course was Missouri's only statewide training for members of the multidisciplinary team on the CAC model. Thankfully, that was our only cancellation. We continue to offer initial training twice annual professional development for advocates working in a CAC, statewide forensic interview peer review, advanced forensic interview or training, and learning opportunities for members of the multidisciplinary team. With the transition to the virtual Child First National Course, two supplemental offerings were developed, an all-day training for any member of the MDT that included state-specific content on the prosecution of child maltreatment cases, medical forensic evaluations, and collaborations between members of the investigative team. The second supplemental gave additional practice to those attendees who would be conducting forensic interviews by offering an opportunity to practice their child first training with an actor portraying a child victim while receiving state specific feedback from Missouri child first faculty. I wanna thank Amy Robbins, Missouri child first faculty coordinator State Forensic Interviewer Support Coordinator and the Forensic Service Program Director for the Child Center in Wentzville. Amy directed our work in this new world with precision and attention to the needs of the state's interviewers. It is a privilege to work with her to execute dynamic learning opportunities. Thank you, Amy. While Amy and I work tirelessly to continue to offer high quality learning opportunities, the Safe Care Network was uniquely poised to continue operations with just few minor shifts. Safe Care training has historically been a hybrid model within learning, in person learning for initial training and a six hour annual update event. In 2020, new provider training was held in person right before the state closed operations for the pandemic. This year's safe care training for medical providers offered six hours of content each day over two days virtually. We hope to hold annual update in person this year, but we acknowledge the need to proceed with caution to ensure the health and well-being of all safety 60 safe care providers, our staff, and the safe care resource center physicians. During 2021, Safe Care's ECHO training will cover 18 different learning topics, all virtually, with 36 case presentations while constantly evolving to respond to the needs of local providers. Dr. Emily Killo, child abuse pediatrician at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, is charged with developing the content for the network's provider training. Dr. Killo flawlessly adjusted the Safe Care program training offerings to include robust learning and engagement for our seasoned providers while bringing new offerings to initial training. Thank you, Dr. Killow, for your expertise and adaptability. It is a delight to collaborate with you for the success of the Safe Care Network. And now I have the privilege of sharing a few musings of Dr. Linda Shaw, a member of the Child Protection Division at Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital, before handing off the award presentation to Dr. Kim, Tim Kutz, Director of the Child Protection Division who nominated Dr. Shaw for Missouri Kids First Standing with Children Award. Dr. Shaw plans to retire this summer and relocate out of state, which made this award presentation a necessity to acknowledge all that Linda has given to the field of child welfare. Safe care provider and colleague and nurse practitioner, Kara Christnell has this to say, Dr. Shaw has been an amazing addition to Cardinal Glennon's child protection team and the entire Missouri safe care community. She is a tireless advocate for patients, families, and coworkers. Linda is generous with her knowledge and time. 
I've learned so much from her the past several years, and I know I'm a better provider because I've been able to work with her. Celeste Williams, nurse practitioner and safe care provider in West Plains at the Child Advocacy Center shared, I've so appreciated Dr. Shaw. She is approachable and truly desires to help you understand the answers to your questions. She has contributed so much to this field of medicine and has made a great impact. Her retirement is well-deserved. Dr. Jamie Condis, child abuse pediatrician at St. Louis Children's Hospital had this to say about Dr. Shaw. I really enjoyed working with Dr. Shaw over the past several years and I will miss working with her so much. She is always calm and collected and always seems to have the right answer no matter what group she is collaborating with. She gives wonderful lectures that are both entertaining and informative. She exudes a calming presence wherever she goes. Most of all, she is a wonderful colleague and friend. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for being gracious with your time and sharing your incredible knowledge with the Safe Care Network and the field of child welfare. Dr. Kutz, will you please present the awards, Dr. Shaw? Sure. All right, so I don't know if I was supposed to be visible, but it doesn't matter to me. Um, so Tim Kutz, Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital. We had the great fortune of having Dr. Shaw join us about nine years ago. Uh, she brought her talents from her previous career in New Jersey. Um, the benefits were her clinical leadership, education, prevention, and advocacy efforts. Uh, Dr. Shaw provides expert assessments of maltreatment, maltreated children at Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital. Uh, she works well with our team of social workers and nurses to ensure children receive the highest quality care. A child's needs and safety are always Dr. Shaw's first priority. Uh, she treats family with compassion and consideration. Dr. Shaw has expended considerable effort educating child welfare advocates across Missouri. She's always willing to teach at the annual safe care trainings. Many times a year, she presents information to new Missouri Children's Division investigators on physical and sexual abuse of children. Child abuse prevention is one of Dr. Shaw's passions. She is a certified trainer for the nationally recognized Stewards of Children program. She serves on Missouri, Missouri's Child Sexual Abuse Prevention Task Force. She's also an active member of the St. Louis Child Abuse and Neglect Network. Dr. Shaw contributes significant time to advocacy efforts. Uh, she created an educational program for the residents at St. Louis University School of Medicine, teaching them advocacy efforts. Uh, she also leads an annual um, group of healthcare providers to Jeff City for the annual advocacy day. Uh, and then in short, uh, Dr. Shaw is a true advocate for children and families in the state of Missouri. She is a kind, caring professional who works ceaselessly to serve the needs of our state's children. Uh, so with that, we present you the Missouri Kids First Standing with Children Award. Well, thank you very much. I'm quite honored. Uh, I appreciate all the kind words. Um, I especially appreciate Dr. Kutz for nominating me. Uh, he's been a great colleague for the last nine years. And I wanna give a shout out to our whole little tiny but mighty division of child protection here at SLU Cardinal Glennon. Without them, I would be nowhere. So thank you to all of you. Uh, next, I'd like to extend my appreciation to Missouri Kids First. Um, they are truly the wind beneath my sails. And uh, I think probably for all of us on, on this Zoom today, they're the power behind us. Uh, as Rebecca explained, they really are those that support and manage the safe care program, all aspects of it. So very, very uh, appreciative of their efforts. And I wanna give my respect to everybody that's on today. I've gotten to know with my work in Missouri, quite a lot of you as colleagues and have seen the power of the multidisciplinary team. So that's been truly, truly a treat for me. I uh, was originally a Missouri girl. I was raised in a small town in Missouri and have been fortunate enough to live many other places since that time um, and never perceived myself or never saw myself as being a, a safe care provider, certainly never being a health care provider. Always wanted to be a social worker, started out as a social worker. And then as I worked in a hospital, uh, realized that medicine was my calling but never thought of child protection as my calling. I wanted to be a doctor that worked with complex medical issues like spina bifida. Uh, but as my journeys continued, um, I ended up 
after uh, living in Seattle for a while and then in San Francisco for a while, I lived in Phoenix about 1986. And there, uh, the division head that was my boss had done some study at the Kemp Center in Colorado. And some of you may know that uh, Henry Kemp was kind of thought of as the founder of child abuse. He's the one that's credited with labeling the battered child syndrome. So this boss uh, who had done some work in the Kemp Center wanted all of the people that worked for him to be proficient in doing evaluations of sexually abused children. So my arm was twisted and I became uh, an, uh, an, an evaluator of children who had been or were suspected to have been sexually abused. So by the time my next move uh, in 1989 was to New Jersey, on my resume was some mention of doing sexual abuse evaluations and immediately that new boss decided that I should be a director of the sexual abuse evaluation program. And over the ensuing next 20 some years, that program grew to be um, a regional, one of the four regional diagnostic and treatment centers in New Jersey. And I became the medical director of a fairly large group of psychologists, social workers, nurses, and doctors that um, covered a large region of New Jersey. So um, then over the ensuing next years, uh, I continue to do general academic pediatric work. And, uh, but increasingly my, my practice uh, became interested in child abuse and neglect. So I was very fortunate and delighted to be one of the first child abuse pediatricians in the cohort of 2009. Uh, it was a brand new specialty, and um, those of us that had worked in the field were able to prove that um, it was an interest of ours and that we had the experience and knowledge to do that. So I was delighted to be uh, a child abuse pediatrician. So that by the time uh, my spouse decided to take a, a job back in Missouri uh, in 2011, uh, I had really fallen for child abuse and neglect. Now that sounds horrible. What, what I mean by that is I really did not want to do general pediatrics any longer. I really wanted to focus on child abuse and neglect. But when I got to Missouri, there was no full-time job available for me at either of the major hospitals, uh, children's hospitals in St. Louis. And thus I have the benefit in disguise the blessing in disguise of having the opportunity to have the time to spend that I've had over the last nine-ish years to be on some of the boards and some of the subcommittees and some of the training opportunities and prevention opportunities and advocacy opportunities that I've been able to participate in. Uh, because uh, you don't make, because there isn't a lot of money to be made in the field of child and abuse and neglect, which is no surprise to any of you, there never was developed a full-time job for me uh, the years that I've been here. So that also gave me the opportunity to get to know many of you. And as I mentioned, develop the respect that I have for the gains that we have made in this field. Um, I think we, any of you that know me well know that I often say that in the, this field, we do a lousy job of prevention. And I believe we do a lousy job of rehabilitation. But now I've also come to realize that we haven't done so well either with our diagnostics, our investigations, our prosecutions. We've got many errors that we've made there, but I'm very optimistic that we're going to do better because we have, we're going to work, continue to work together. And I'll close with um, a saying that I have on a, a placard that I got from the previous job that I left uh, 12 years ago, that I'm hopeful that 100 years from now, it won't matter. It won't matter the kind of car we drove, the kind of house we lived in, how much money we had in the bank, but it will matter that we make a life a difference in the lives of children. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your dedication to the well-being of Missouri's children. Your expertise will be a great loss to the state, but you aren't done yet. We'll see you in June for your Echo presentation, and we love you. Now I have the privilege to welcome Missouri Stewards and Children Network Coordinator, Jenny dodson weil who will present the Standing with Children Award to this year's prevention recipient. Jenny? Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Dr. Shaw, for all you've done to um, raise the issue of primary prevention. We so appreciate all you've done. Missouri Kids First is a state leader in child sexual abuse prevention education. 
This is accomplished through our coordination of a statewide network of over 50 facilitators who provide darkness to lights, stewards of children, child sexual abuse prevention training to adults. This training teaches adults to prevent, recognize, and react responsibly to child sexual abuse. This dedicated group of facilitators represents a wide variety of organizations throughout the state of Missouri. A truly collective effort, we aspire to train 5% of the adult population in every county in the state of Missouri. And in 2020, we were able to celebrate the milestone of having trained 20,000 adults since the program's inception. One of the more passionate groups of facilitators comes from Missouri Baptist Children's Home. Missouri Baptist Children's Home started providing the Stewards of Children training due to the extraordinary efforts of Patrice Mugg. She independently became a Stewards of Children facilitator in 2015. She alone has trained over 1,100 adults. This is simply extraordinary. In 2019, she reached out to and met with leaders from Missouri Baptist Children's Home, where she introduced them to the Stewards of Children training. Patrice continues to be an active facilitator and collaborator with Missouri Baptist Children's Home and with our Missouri Stewards of Children facilitator network. Since 2019, David Birch, church engagement strategist for Missouri Baptist Children's Home, Children and Family Ministries, has led the organization's Stewards of Children's efforts, where he has prior prioritized the training of 14 Missouri Baptist Children's Home Authorized Stewards of Children facilitators. In addition, Missouri Baptist Children's Home is working towards Darkness to Light's Partners in Prevention Distinction, which it hopes to achieve by later in 2021. Organizations with this distinction make prevention a priority by using the Stewards of Children training to train staff and volunteers who interact with youth. They conduct background checks on staff and volunteers who work with youth and implement policies that limit opportunities for one adult to be alone with one child. Missouri Baptist Children's Home training efforts are not limited to their own organization. They've provided stewards of children's trainings to churches, church leadership organizations, schools, and camps. In some instances, they've also provided technical assistance to these organizations to support the creation or update their child protection policies and codes of conduct. Missouri Baptist Children's Home and its affiliates has sought out collaboration and partnership as a member of the Missouri Stewards of Children Facilitator Network. As Darkness to Light was rolling out their virtual learning option, just like we've heard everyone else having to pivot in this time, two facilitators from the Lighthouse, Julie Ball and Julie Karanja, who'd been trained just as things were closing down or before they were in February of 2020, and had yet to facilitate a training, reached out to Missouri Kids First. In conjunction with Missouri Kids First and a seasoned Missouri Baptist Children's Home facilitator, George Fulgrim, uh, we all together provided training to 125 Kansas City public school teachers before they began their school year. Getting this information to teachers at this particular moment in time was important in Missouri Baptist Children's Home made this happen. Missouri Baptist Children's Home, through its affiliates, Missouri Baptist Children's Home Children and Family Ministries the Light and the Lighthouse is deserving of the 2021 Standing with Children's Award because the organization has significantly raised awareness of issues facing abused children and the Child Advocacy Center's role in advocating for the best interest of children by training over 2,500 Missouri adults to prevent, recognize, and respond to child sexual abuse through Darkness to Light's Stewards of Children training. I am delighted to welcome Ramona Conrad Cooper, Vice President of Missouri Baptist Children's Home Children and Family Ministries to accept this award on behalf of the organization. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for those kind words. We feel so honored to receive the Standing with Children Award. Our board chair, Leah Caps, is here today, as well as David Birch, our church engagement strategist. 
And, you know, because we are a faith-based agency, we do have access to and partnerships with churches and other like community organizations. And we realize that stewards of children would be a critical training to provide for these organizations and that it fits perfectly with our mission of responding to the needs of children, youth, and families to make a lasting difference in their lives. I want to recognize and say thank you to David who coordinated all of our efforts in making this training available to churches across Missouri. Um, as Jenny said, with the result of training more than 2,500 adults, the feedback that we have received regarding stewards of children training has just been extremely positive. We hear people say all the time that they learn so much through the training regarding how to prevent, recognize, and respond to child sexual abuse. Providing stewards of children training has also opened some doors for us to work alongside churches on child protection policy, as well as offer trainings on trauma and how it affects children and families. We found the church to be an excellent place to equip natural helpers to respond to needs in their communities. I also, as Jenny noted, uh, Patrice Mug, I want to thank Patrice as well. Um, she played a strong role in encouraging our agency to make stewards of children training a priority. We appreciate so much Patrice's passion for protecting children. She's been an inspiration to our agency and she continues to be a part of our MBCH Stewards of Children facilitator team. We're also honored to participate in the statewide Stewards of Children facilitators network with Missouri Kids First. Through this network, we've been assisted with technical issues, helped to access grant funding for training materials, and have even been provided some scholarships for facilitator training. It's a wonderful network that we have found to be so helpful. So once again, on behalf of Missouri Baptist Children's Home, thank you so much for this award. It's a great honor for our agency. We have a facilitator team of 14, as Jenny said, and we plan to continue to bring the message of keeping children safe from sexual abuse to churches and other community organizations across our state. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona, and thank you to your whole team. We are so appreciative of them, and uh, we are so appreciative of them standing with children by providing uh, child sexual abuse prevention training. With that, I will now welcome Jessica Seitz, our Director of Public Policy. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Missouri Kids First mission is to empower adults to protect kids. And a key part of this work is our work to educate policymakers to inspire legislative change. Over the years since our founding, we've worked to improve the way that Missouri systems respond to issues of child abuse and neglect. And over the years, we've established a track record of legislative success. And each year in the public policy advocacy category, we typically honor our legislative champions, those lawmakers who have really helped to um, push you know, our priorities over the finish line. Um, but this year, I have the honor of recognizing the Kansas City stars, Laura Bauer and Judy Thomas, who have made a career in investigative journalism, highlighting issues in our child welfare systems in Missouri, Kansas, and across the nation, and whose recent reporting on the lack of oversight of Missouri unlicensed youth residential facilities launched a statewide investigation and a legislative initiative that has topped Missouri Kids First legislative agenda this year. Our media is commonly called the fourth pillar of democracy, or the fourth branch of government. It's our press that makes us aware of social and political activities happening around the state. Media exposes loopholes in our systems, in our child welfare systems, our criminal justice system, and so on. They make our systems more accountable, more responsive, and more accessible to citizens. Investigative journalism is painstaking, often expensive work, but it yields explosive findings that attract the attention of our decision makers, prompting action to be taken. And this has been the case so many times in the careers of Laura Bauer and Judy Thomas. Laura Bauer specializes in long-term investigative projects and journalism that demands accountability. An alum of Missouri State University, she has served as an investigative reporter with the Kansas City Star since 2005 after stints with the Courier Journal in Louisville, Kentucky and the Springfield Newsletter. 
Judy Thomas has been an investigative journalist with the Kansas City Star for 26 years. An alum of Kansas State University, Thomas specializes in long-term projects that hold government and others in power accountable. Over the years, these two have teamed up and the pattern of their work has inspired meaningful political change. In 2017, both Bauer and Thomas were nominated as a team for a Pulitzer Prize um, for their work on a series called Why So Secret Kansas. Their journalism then exposed a state government's decades long obsession with secrecy. In one story of the series, in fact, titled Secrecy Within the Child Welfare System Can Kill, Bauer exposed secrecy within Kansas's child protection system, a pervasive effort to keep the public from knowing how it operates, particularly in cases of child fatalities or serious injuries. This series won nine national honors, inspired more than two dozen bills to be introduced in the legislature, and has led to new laws in Kansas and a, a change in how their state government operates. Then again in 2019, Bauer and Thomas embarked on a year-long project called Throwaway Kids, a nationwide investigation into what happens to children across the nation after they age out of the foster care system. Bauer and Thomas found that children who grow up in foster care suffer lifelong harm from the very government that was supposed to make their lives better. This six-part series led to legislative state changes in several states and prompted a call for action from attorneys, advocates, and state agencies. The series won a National Headliner Award for public service, and the judges called it ambitious reporting on a topic that is too often overlooked, period. From intensely personal interviews to a survey of prisons in a dozen states around the country, the star staff was all in. Well, this year, Bauer and Thomas are again all in. Beginning in September of this past, in 2020, they've published over 20 stories related to child abuse in unlicensed reform schools in Missouri. Their reporting shined a light on an issue that had gone unaddressed by the child welfare and criminal justice systems, advocates and lawmakers. Through their reporting, Missourians found out that we are only one of two states that require no additional regulations or licensing to operate these boarding schools that the Department of Social Services had substantiated allegations of abuse and neglect, including sexual and physical abuse, at three schools in Southwest Missouri, all which fall under our blanket exception, our loophole. Um, at least seven schools moved to Missouri after being investigated or shut down in other states for abuse or neglect. And this included a story highlighting that just months after Alabama lawmakers tightened their own laws, a school shut up, shut its doors amid allegations of abuse and moved straight to Missouri. Bowers and Thomas, Bauer and Thomas's coverage catapulted this issue into the spotlight in this fall. Right now, um, the Attorney General's office is investigating some of these facilities and over 100 charges have been filed against the owners of one in what Attorney General Smith called one of the only excuse me, one of the most widespread cases of physical and mental abuse, sexual, physical, and mental abuse patterns against young girls and young women in Missouri history. Their coverage of this issue also has motivated lawmakers to introduce House Bills 557 and 560 to address this problem. This bill is under consideration right now. We've been working on it all sessions since lawmakers returned in January. Um, it passed the full House unanimously in March, and it passed Senate committee unanimously just last week. I encourage everyone here to check out the work of these outstanding journalists. We're so lucky to have them here in our state. Thank you to Laura Bauer and Judy Starr and the Kansas City Star as a whole for standing with Missouri children. And Laura Bauer is with us today to accept this. Hi, I think I'm working. <laughs> um, I never um, prepare anything. I just talk from the hip, so I hope that's okay. Um, Judy and I are just so grateful for this award and to be recognized by people who do stand up for children every day and who work uh, on their behalf and do it tirelessly. And we are just so honored. Judy couldn't be here today because she had a family obligation and she also knows that I'm the talker of the two of us, so I think um, she she was cool to let me do the talking. Um, one thing with um, Judy and I first, we'd like to thank uh, Lisa for nominating us and uh, thank all of the advocates and um, lawmakers 
who, uh, you know, answer our calls and, and help us do this work. And we are so fortunate um, to work for a media company who truly values the long-term impactful journalism, um, the work that does make a difference. And what Judy and I, um, what we are so grateful for is that early on when we started working together, we recognized that children need a voice, that too often um, people don't know what is happening to children and they're not able to reach out and say and and it's been about a decade that we started working together. And it was shortly after um, a little girl in Kansas City named Only in Records as LP was found um, in a closet. And she had been isolated from basically the world for about five years. And she was targeted child. And so many systems put in place to protect children in Missouri had failed her. And around that same time, there were several other children that were um, isolated, that were um, chained to poles in a basement, that were locked in a spare bedroom. Um, Judy and I continued to work on those to expose what was happening, um, not in any way to place blame, but to show how the system had failed them. And that led to uh, another project shortly after looking at Jackson County Children's Division and um, really telling the stories of workers there that caseloads were high and, and turnover was incredible and really just showing that more needed to be done in Missouri to help them help children. And, you know, it's a partnership that has worked so well for both of us um because we both like the kind of work that does um, make a difference that does show what needs to be done and we both like talking to people and sharing their stories and you know we did that in 2017 with secret kansas and um really did that again in 2019 with throwaway kids that was so important to us that story um, because we had known for years that children that had been raised in the system across the country, too often their outcomes um, were, were dismal. They were, became homeless, they went to jail, they went later to prison. And we were always so busy doing stories about tragedies happening today, happening to kids in care, that we never really looked at the long-term effect. And you know, I know Judy, she traveled for that project down to um, death row in Texas and wrote about a young man who even wrote the book from foster care to death row, Texas death row. And those stories were really impactful because of the difference they made across the country, but also the difference they made in the lives of the young people that we spoke to. They said they finally, they finally felt they had a voice and that's what means so much to the two of us and why I think our partnership works so well. And um, we even finish each other's sentences these days. <laughs> we work together so much. But in the last um, six months, um, I will kind of be brief with this, but what we have found is how the network in Missouri works and how it takes what you all do every day um, and what lawmakers do every day and um, you know advocates like um, like Jessica and Emily and who we lovingly call the Kansas City's two lorries and, and what you all do to try to make lives better for children. We wrote a story in September, I think it was September 6th on Circle of Hope, September 7th, um, Carrie Ingle, um, Representative Ingle was asking for a legislative hearing. We wrote another one on November 8th um, on Agape, a nearby school. November 9th was the first legislative hearing. Um, Jessica's working on it, Emily is. Um, all throughout um, the state, advocates and lawmakers are working to make lives better for these kids. The stories did continue um, and so has the effort. And um, it, you know, many people say for the first time there could be regulation for, for these schools and I think you know, when the, the hope with journalism is to shine a light on what is happening, expose the wrongdoing, and so it can be fixed. And 
So that is what we've been trying to do for 10 years. And, and we really just are honored with this award. So thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. We really appreciate your work. Um, like I said, I encourage everyone to check out um, the work in the series that Laura and Judy have have um, have done this year because it's because it's been really extraordinary. Um, well, the staff at Missouri Kids First is so grateful to our members and partners for your support this year. It's been quite a year. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jack Jensen, our board president, um, for final words and close. We thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon. Uh, building resiliency in children that have suffered neglect or abuse is key to the work of Missouri Kids First, the CACs, and all the partner organizations that help children through the trauma that they experience. I see this work as I review case as a member of Missouri's Child Abuse and Neglect Review Boards. In the cases the board, <clears throat> excuse me, as my computer doesn't cooperate. In the cases the board reviews, a trained mandated reporter, be it an educator, a healthcare provider, a police officer, or a community member skillfully listens against the process of protecting the child. The reports document how the family service workers interact and implement resources for the child's immediate safety while indigations are completed. In the interviews at the CACs, it is clear how the caring team, how caring the teams are as the child tells of the tra traumatic experience they have endured. Finally, see the coordinated plans by all the different agencies to help the child heal. Often at the end of these hearings, the board will ask, how is the child doing? Often we hear they are succeeding in school, the completed courses to help them be better parents, or they're in a setting where they are safe and they can grow. Every step that led the child to this better place helped them build resiliency. I will close the program with a thank you for the work to stand by children on a daily basis. It is the world's resilient children and saves their lives. I can't think of any more important work than protecting children. Thank you for all you do and have a great day, everyone. All right, thank you, Jack. And, and again, thank you to everyone for taking some time to, to spend a, a little bit of time with us today. We really appreciate your support and we'd look forward to seeing you in person next year. Yes. <clears throat>